My name is Eric Bichard. I'm here to talk with you guys today about state management with React Hooks. Um, I'm a Kindo React developer advocate at Progress. Um, first, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I won't spend too much on it, but um, I'm mostly a component developer. So unlike some of the, you guys that build libraries and stuff, uh, that's not really my jam. But um, I've worked for SolarCity and Tesla. I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, more recently, work with Progress and uh, yeah, so uh, like Kindle React, uh, these are components that you pay for. So I think uh, Kitsy's grandmother would probably think uh, I'm pretty cool because we, we make people pay for them. I uh, thought I'd tell that joke. Anyways, <laughs> so I also want to uh, just let you guys know that all of the, uh, the slides and the information that I give on here, I'm going to talk about a few different videos. I'm going to go over a timeline about um, hooks and uh, state management in React and kind of the history of it. It would be re really quick. But uh, links to all those videos are at the, uh, I'm going to show this at the end of my presentation, but if you want to take a picture of this, uh, it's going to have the demo for my GitHub demo that I do as well. All right, so um, a little bit of background. I was an Angular developer at one point in time and also a full stack C Sharp developer. Um, and one of the issues that I always ran into um, was that when I was working on full stack applications in C Sharp, and when I was working on front end applications in Angular, there wasn't really a prescribed way of doing state management. So that means that all the projects that I worked on eventually became monolithic applications, and everyone kind of had their own way of doing state management. Um, when I left Tesla, I started looking for uh, new jobs, and I found React uh, not only to be exactly what I was looking for, but it also had a really good prescribed way of doing state management. And that kind of leads into this timeline here. Um, so since the beginning in 2013 when React was released, set state was kind of already a thing. And in fact, um, has anyone seen this video? Anyone? Hands up? Okay. So this is back in 2013. This is Tom Ochino and uh, Jordan Walk, and this is an introduction to React.js. It's a horrible video to watch because it's only at like 480 <laughs> um, and it doesn't get any bigger, but it's actually very uh, interesting to go through and watch it and understand kind of back then in 2013 what their vision for React was. And a lot of it still makes sense today. Um, in 2014, Flux was previewed at F8. And um, one of the things that I thought was very interesting about, okay, so I'm gonna kind of have these little videos lined up with each point in the timeline. And again, these are going to be uh, in my notes, and you can go to watch each of these videos if you want to. Um, but one of the things that Jing Chen uh, talked about in this video was about the MVC model. And I worked with ASP.NET MVC and a few other MVC uh, frameworks. And the issues with those were always scalability. And once you got a lot of models and lots of views, um, you always had this kind of uh, all of these arrows going back and forth to each one. And it was very hard to keep in your head uh, kind of this mental model. Um, in this video, they kind of talk about Flux for the first time and show the model and how that works. And when I started learning about Flux, I knew that this is exactly kind of uh, what I wanted to uh, use in, in, in React. And I thought it was, uh, I know that behind the scenes is kind of also how set state works and now how hooks works as well. It's not exactly, but it's similar. Um, because believe me, as a component developer, I am not the one you want in your project figuring out how to do all the state management and coming up and rolling my own uh, uh, ideas of how to do that. Even, even, even with Redux and some of these libraries that help you out, you just, that's not something you want me doing. You want me focusing on CSS, uh, JavaScript, HTML, and uh, you know, taking direction from the design department and building you know, beautiful components for other developers to use. In 2015, uh, this, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys have seen this video. This is Dan Abramov's uh, live React hot loading with time travel at React Europe 2015. So this is when we first kind of learned about uh, Redux. And this workflow even uh, looks pretty similar to what a lot of us are doing today. Not exactly, but, but similar. Um, and then in 2017 came React Fiber. So React Fiber was um, a complete rewrite of the core reconciliation algorithm inside React. But it also kind of set the stage for 16x version of, of React. And with that version um, came a lot of I guess, developer experiences and things. Lynn Clark has an excellent video. It's called a cartoon intro to fiber, which by the way, uh, fiber is a very complex topic. 
but she breaks it down very simply. And so this is kind of one of the last videos I'm going to end with this on, on this timeline. But I think that it would be interesting to go back and kind of watch these all in succession to kind of figure out if, if you're new to React, one, kind of where the history comes from, uh, but also just to kind of figure out where we were, where we've gotten to now, and kind of uh, why hooks is so important. Um, I know that a lot of people kind of talk about hooks and like, yeah, it's not great for everything, and um, you know, maybe you shouldn't be doing global state and things like this with it, but um, I found it very easy to work with as a, a new developer to React within the last year or so. And uh, one of the first things that I worked with was in 2018 was a context API. So since hooks, um, the context API has even become even more easier to use with things like use context. So it's kind of the, uh, the end of the timeline. But um, I just wanted to kind of uh, go over kind of where we came from, where we're at now, and, and kind of what set the stage for all these new developer experiences. And that's one of the things that I really like about React is that all of the thoughtfulness that they put into uh, developing this API, uh, kind of not messing up the API from before for the, for the most part. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been amazing to work with React over the last year and a half, and to be honest, to get away from Angular. Um, but I, I do love Angular. I love the Angular community. It's where I started. But uh, I, I love React uh, a lot more. <laughs> um, yeah, so back in, I, I guess it was February, uh, almost spring of 2018, uh, 2019, we got the 16.8 version of React, which was the release with hooks, uh, the one with hooks. And so that kind of uh, set the stage for what we can do now with hooks. Uh, so hooks specifically provide um, to React, a stateful primitive that's simpler than a class component. And just like Kitsy said earlier, like, we, like I don't want to use classes. That's why I moved away from Angular. I like the functional uh, aspect of React, the fact that everything is a function, that JSX is just, you know, uh, underneath it all just a bunch of function calls returning functions. So um, again, a stateful primitive, simpler than using class components. Um, contain composable behaviors. These are all the things that, as a component developer, make it very easy for me to do my job. So what does this mean for the average developer and people like me who, who use hooks? Well, it means that in a functional component, you can do things like add state, add regular or custom hooks to that functional component. You can share non-visual logic and do code reuse, um, remove distributive logic, and, and co-locate it into different effects. So these are all things that kind of make your code clear and concise. Uh, as well, HOCs and render props, uh, it, kinda, it can get you away from that. You can, can still use that stuff if you want to. Um, and of course, you can use classes right next to hooks. So you don't have to rewrite everything right now. Obviously, we all know that. Um, you can use all that stuff side by side, and there's no problem with it. In fact, it doesn't really make sense to go back and write some of those things, uh, since you can use it side by side, unless there is, for some reason, some type of a benefit that you're getting out of it. Because most of the benefit from hooks, I believe, is just um, readability. A new person joins my team. It's going to be easier for them to understand what's going on. Uh, less code on the screen, you know, I guess. Um, most of us know the four rules of hooks, but uh, you know, don't call it from within a loop. From within a loop, nested functions—they sit at the top level. Um, only call it from a functional component or another custom hook. Um, and the easiest way to kind of make sure that you're staying true to these rules is to use a very simple npm uh, package called eslint plugin react hooks. So that's something I recommend installing if you don't have it installed. And um, that way, as you're developing, you can get uh, errors and warnings to show whether you're doing things right or wrong. So I'm going to kind of go over just really quickly a few of the uh, few code examples for use state and use effect. I won't spend too much time on this because I feel like a lot of people should know this stuff already. I've been giving this, hook, this hooks talk for almost a year, and it's advanced a little bit, but some of this stuff, um, again, we don't really need to spend a whole lot of time on. But this is kind of like what we used to use um, for a simple canonical counter example. And I know this is contrived counter example, but it's interesting to look at kind of what, what these classes looked like before and kind of what they look like afterwards with hooks, right? We've got a lot more room on that screen. In fact, we can probably blow it up a little bit. Uh, it's another thing that's good with hooks is you can now show the, uh, your code a little bit larger on the screen at a conference like this where you've got two-story stage uh, <laughs> displays behind you. So yeah, I mean, from that to this, no more binding, a little bit easier to uh, grok, understand kind of what's going on here. Now, 
Let's go back real quick. Use state, uh, very simple in its use. You call use state. You pass in uh, ba basically an initializer, like a zero, like we want to start at zero. And then we destructure that to get count, which is the actual uh, state, and then a way to go ahead and update that state with set count. Um, then we write a little function like increment count, and now we can easily set count. And we, all we have to do is tell React, what do we want our new state to look like? And then it'll take care of the rest for us. So that's what I like as a component developer, is that I can kind of let React do the heavy lifting for me and uh, not have to worry about things like how to manage state in the background. And that really becomes apparent when you start using other things like use effect and even use reducer. We'll go over use effect really quickly here. So again, here's our, our new functional component. And uh, to add an effect to this basically means we want to we want to do something outside of our outside of our functional component or outside of our application maybe, uh, like update the document title. Again, a canonical, a contrived example, but if you think about it, updating that document title happens outside of the application. It's similar to fetching data, it's similar to um, you know setting something in IndexedDB or maybe um, setting something in the browser, um, setting something in the database. We want to do something outside of our application. By the way, this is, that's, what the, that's kind of the same code that you would have in a class component that you can do right here, in a, in a functional component with uh, hooks and use effects. Yeah, so a big change, a lot more easy to read. So a few tricks to using use effect, using use effect, um, are that we can pass in a second argument. And what this second argument allows us to do is to, uh, for instance, we can pass in an empty array so that we can only render our effect on the initial render. Now, if you don't pass in that second argument, you're going to get a re-render on the initial render and every subsequent render. And then if you pass dependencies into that array, like ID or name, then what happens is our, our effect only runs whenever those pieces of state change. And so uh, with this, you can get pretty fine grain control of when the render happens and when it doesn't. And uh, for me, so far, this has been uh, enough. Uh, I haven't ran into any major problems where I, um, like as long as I'm composing components correctly, this works enough for me. Also, we can clean up uh, after our effects very easily by just using the return statement. So if we pass a function into our return, uh, we can do something like unsubscribe from something we just subscribed to as soon as the, uh, as soon as the component is unloaded from the DOM. So um, here, yeah, we're basically subscribing with someone's username, and then again, after everything's done, we're unsubscribing. So this is kind of how you do cleanup afterwards. Um, again, a very contrived example. So another powerful hook that's built into React and kind of the thing that I want to focus on mostly today is use reducer. But before we go into the demo, I want to show you a little bit about kind of what reducers are in case you need a refresher. Um, a reducer in plain JS is just a method that executes a provided reducer function. And on each element of say an array, it returns a single output at the end. So some of the things that you can do with that are you can create a sum uh, reducer, where uh, here we have these votes by district. Again, contrived example, we have 250 votes in one, 510 in another, 330, 410. So we have these different districts with these different numbers, and then we want to add them all together and return that as one value at the end. So um, we have an accumulator, we have a current value, and we always return uh, whatever we're accumulating with the next value in the list. So if we just run our first example here, all those numbers add up to 1500. So that's what we get uh, returned to us. But just like uh, use reducer, we can pass in a second argument, and that can be kind of, a, uh, we can initialize that value. So if we passed in 100 here, we would end up with 1600 as the output. Another thing that you can do is instead of doing something like adding them all together, we could take a list of to-dos, um, and we could go through, and based on priority, we could return the one to-do that has the highest priority. So that's kind of what we're doing here. We have this uh, array, it's got several objects in it. Each of them has a priority. As we loop through and kind of uh, continue to recursively go through that array, we are uh, consistently remembering what the highest value was so far 
and returning that. Otherwise, um, if, if it is higher, then we'll just go ahead and return that to do and replace it with the highest. So again, at the bottom, we have an example where we run a reducer uh, using this uh, array with these objects in it. And of course, it's going to return the one that has uh, the highest priority. So you can do lots of things with uh, reducers, and uh, managing state is a great thing to do with them. So again, use reducer. It's a uh, use reducer it, that is provided to you by React Hooks. This is an alternate way of using use state. So instead of use state where we basically have one value and one way to update that value, when we use use reducer, think about it in our to-dos application where we want to be able to maybe add a to-do, remove a to-do, clear a to-do, whatever. We can, uh, we can use it in a, a situation where we have more uh, complex state that's involving many sub-values. Um, and it's just super easy to use, returns the current state paired with a dispatch method, pretty much. This is a very simplified uh, way of looking at kind of what use reducer is and what, the, what its flow is. You basically have a dispatcher somewhere, uh, a function that dispatches an action. That gets handled by a reducer. You tell it kind of what that new state's going to look like, and that new state gets returned. And then that's, uh, well, in our situation here where we have to-dos, this dispatch is what we'll call when we want to dispatch some type of an action. And so you can kind of update that, that view to look like this, where we have a dispatcher. It dispatches an action. That gets handled by a reducer. In our case, it's called to-do reducer. And then uh, that new state gets returned and is, is available for us to use in that to-dos. So what I want to do for you real quick is to just build a simple application. Uh, we already kind of have it built, and I'll show you a little bit about that. Oops, uh, let's go here. And we've already got it running. So what we're going to uh, finish up is let's assume that we are working for a team, and they've built this nice little to-do uh, application for us. Um, they've, they've dropped in some components. Look, they're using Kindle React. Wow. Um, they've got a, an input here, an add to-do button. We've got a grid that has a list of um, to-dos that we passed in a, as an initializer, so kind of so the guy could create a pr prototype for us, I guess. We've got a remove all. But we've also got some other things going on inside this application that I'm using hooks for as well. If we, uh, we have like, like a responsive navigation here. By the way, this demo is available at the end of the slides in that, that link I give you. Um, and so I am also toggling the navigation. I'm opening the side navigation. I'm controlling the theme from light to dark. Uh, all these things I'm doing with kind of global state. Uh, <laughs> and I'm using, uh, so I'm using context API with a, a couple of uh, values that I'm kind of keeping track of with that context API. And then everywhere in my application where I want to be able to affect uh, this context, um, I am basically able to use that uh, anywhere in my application and just say context dot, you know, uh, up, update theme or whatever, or set theme. So it, uh, I, I'm, I'm, when you go and look at this demo, you can find a lot of different ways that I went through and kind of used hooks. Um, here's kind of the main JS. Um, another thing that I'm using uh, it for, I'm using a custom hook right here called use media predicate. And this way I can keep track of uh, where, the, where the browser's at. Is it medium or small at the current uh, point? I can then use that to set a class here. And so this app container actually has another class that's either uh, medium or small. And based off that, I can make decisions with CSS on other things to do, like hide the navigation or show it or change a color somewhere, whatever we want to do. Um, I've also got this nice little alert, which will come in kind of at the end. This is, uh, an, this is an accessibility uh, component that allows me to kind of add messages to a queue, and then I can announce to the screen reader kind of what's going on on the page. But let's go ahead and uh, build our to-do page real quick, and it's going to be super easy. I've already got it all. You're not going to have to watch me type or anything, because I'm going to just use some snippets here. But kind of the, the first thing we want to do is uh, go down here and look at our JSX. So we've got, um, we've got an input up here, which we can type into. We've got a button that can add a to-do. We've got a grid that shows all of our uh, to-dos. Inside that grid, we've got a complete button and a delete button and another clear button at the bottom. Now, they've already got calls out to some functions up here. So what I'm going to do 
is I'm just going to fill these in really quickly and show you how we would use use reducer in this case. So here, we're just basically using uh, use reducer uh, to create our to-dos uh, state. We're passing in an uh, initial state as, the, as what we're going to start with, and that's just basically a couple to-dos to, uh, to, to get us going. Um, also, since our guy that prototyped this uh, used initialize state down here, we've got to change this to to-dos. All right. And then go back up here. I also, another thing I want to do is I want to have an effect in here. So what we'll do is we'll keep track of completed to-dos. So we'll do a filter on top of our uh, to-dos uh, object and basically say, let's keep track at all times how many to-dos are already completed. Another thing we need to do is we need to make sure that every time we type into the input that we've got a function that uh, uses set text input, uh, which is just using use state, not a use reducer. And that way, every time we type into the input, it will update uh, that state so that whenever we want to use that value, when we add a new to-do, we can just, we can just uh, grab that value and send it off so that we can give the to-do a name. Um, and if we put that there, we also need to go in here and kind of put an on change in here. Um, all right, so on change, we're gonna update the text input. Uh, our value will always be text input. And now, so, so now we're kind of ready to add our first uh, dispatch to add a to-do. Oops, wrong one. All right, so uh, pretty easy. All we're doing is we're saying dispatch. Uh, the type is gonna be add to-do. The name is going to be grabbed from that text input, right? So anything we've typed in there is going to go get sent off for the name of the, of the to-do. And we want to set all to-dos at the beginning to be false, because when we add a to-do, we don't want it to automatically be uh, true. Next, what we need to do is we need to go into our, our reducer and just go ahead and make sure we know uh, what we're passing back here to, to the state. So, what we do is we say, hey, if action.name has a length to it, in other words, if someone's typed something in, we want to take the state that we already have and spread that out. We also want to append one object onto the end of it. Uh, we're just going to use state.length uh, and, and kind of add one to it for the ID, which is good enough for a demo. And for name and complete, we're just going to take the values that we passed in. Right. Pretty easy. And uh, for since we don't have a whole lot of time, I'm just going to go ahead and do all of these at one time here. So we've got our dispatch to complete it to do. We've got a dispatch to delete it to do. Super easy. And all this is pretty much the same. Uh, that first add to do is the only one that's kind of different. And then we have a dispatch to clear to do's. So we're covered there. Now if we go back to our reducer. Now we just need to have uh, tell our state kind of how to be updated for each one of these. So here, um, for when we're going to toggle one complete, what we want to do is say, hey, let's take the state, let's map that out, and uh, we're going to look at the item ID that we passed in, and for anyone that matches it, we're going to return that to do specifically and flip its complete value. And then any other ones, we're just going to return that to do on its own. So at the end, we return all the to-dos with just the one that we, that, that we specified with that complete flipped. And then to delete one, it's even easier because all we want to do is take that state, filter it, check the ID, and then uh, we're going to remove this one kind of from the list. We're going to filter it out. The easiest one is this one here at the end, right? Just going to return an empty array. When we want to clear it, we just want to return an empty array. So, what that should give us now is take out the cat. All right, let's do take out the dog too. All right, so now um, when we check one complete, uh, it'll complete the to do. When we remove it, it should remove the to do. Obviously, when we added it, it adds it. And if we want to remove them all, it removes them. Now, um, 
there's one thing that's not working, but I'm not really going to go, oh, here it is. We didn't add our effect. That's why. All right. So now if we go back, we should see this document title update for each one of them. I can't spell. But anyway, so as I check them, right, we've got, we're, we see that that uh, document title is updating for each one. If we remove them, it's updating as well because that completed to do is always keeping track of it. And for someone like me who's just building components and kind of uh, wiring things up, this is exactly how I want React to work. It's super easy to work with, uh, and it, this is exactly, uh, again, this helps me out immensely. One more thing that I want to uh, show you is that, uh, I know I'm running out of time, but um, we're, our job is really not done here as developers because um, one thing that you kind of get when you, when you use components here is um, you get these little islands, uh, like Kindle React components, they have pretty decent accessibility, but you're just getting little islands of accessibility throughout the application. But there's, everything around those components is like a sea, you know, like an ocean. But <laughs> there's like a sea of other things going on that uh, are not accessible. So even though I use components that are accessible, my page is still not accessible. And although I'm not gonna uh, spin up NVDA and kind of show you how shitty this page is right now, what I am gonna do is I'm gonna show you another page where um, I've added about eight or nine lines of code in here. Um, I'm using context here to basically set a screen reader announcement and uh, for use effect. Um, also, each time I add, delete, toggle or clear the to-dos. I'm, I'm making a screen reader announcement. Um, if we go down to my JSX, I've added um, some ARIA labels, and I'm you know, kind of cleverly uh, setting those labels so that when the screen reader hits those buttons, or, uh, or whenever I clear all the to-dos or add one, the screen reader says, hey, you know, whatever to-do, removed. Take out the, the cat, uh, completed. Take out the cat, removed. Uh, three completed to-dos. Um, so, I haven't done a whole lot of uh, changes here, but I've done enough so that now my, my page has gone from being not so accessible to being accessible, and I didn't have to do a whole lot of work here. So that's kind of it for the demo, but uh, well, kind of what I want to leave you guys with is uh, this graphic here, because as developers, as we're working uh, on products and, uh, and shipping them, we need to be cognizant of how accessible these applications are for other people. And it, sometimes it doesn't take a whole lot to go ahead and make them accessible. So what I wanna say as we kind of close out this conference is to you know, make sure that as a community that we're thinking about diversity and inclusion, of which accessibility is a huge part of. Um, support and amplify voices of everyone regardless of backgrounds or their differences. Don't be afraid to start small and grow with accessibility uh, in your work. And uh, you don't need to be perfect to have a positive impact for using accessibility, right? You can start small and kind of, uh, and still have a positive impact. Again, here's the links to all the information in my talk. Give you just a second to look at that. It's pretty easy. Is uh, the O is missing on purpose because I was using Bitly and progress wasn't available. Um, but that's pretty much my talk. So thank you very much, React Live uh, and Amsterdam. And you guys have a wonderful day. And uh, hope to see you guys out at the party.